before Allie McBeal, the practice, and Boston Legal. And before Law and Order became a franchise, there was John Grisham. As an international best-selling author of the 1990s, Grisham perfected the art of the modern legal thriller in a breathtaking series of books from A Time to Kill and The Firm to The Innocent Man and The Associate. He has written 23 books, all of which are available in print, audio, and now digital formats. More than 250 million copies have been sold worldwide, and his works have been translated into 29 languages. Nine of his books have been made into movies. Grisham's heroes have been portrayed by no less than Tom Cruise, Julia Roberts, Susan Sarandon, Matthew McConaughey, Chris O'Donnell, John Cusack, and Matt Damon. I doubt any other author could match that list. John's passionate commitment to social justice plays out in his fiction. One reviewer noted that no other writer is quite so keen-eyed or as fierce a social critic. He's an idealist, but not an optimist, a moralist, but not a moralizer. His heroes are often young lawyers facing off against powerful and corrupt enemies. In their quest for justice, they triumph by abandoning the rules and exhibiting what one observer called moral pluck. Grisham has plenty of moral pluck himself, devoting considerable time to charitable causes. He serves on the board of the Innocence Project, a litigation and public policy organization dedicated to exonerating the wrongfully convicted. After Hurricane Katrina, he established the Rebuild the Coast Fund, raising $8.8 .8 million for hurricane relief projects. For those of you who are still worrying about your career choices, you might be reassured to hear that John Grisham had two careers before finding his calling as a writer. First as an attorney, and second as a member of the Mississippi House of Representatives. And he did not major in English. <laughs> Instead, he holds a Bachelor of Science in Accounting from Mich Mississippi State University and a Juris Doctor from the University of Mississippi Law School. And though, and though I do not list it on my uh, personal CV, I'm very proud of the fact that on page 147 in the associate, there is a Dr. Thorpe. <laughs> Thank you, John. And it's, it's not in his official bio, but I have it on great authority that he is also a passionate follower of Carolina basketball. Please welcome Carolina's great friend, John Grisham. Thank you, uh, Holden Thorpe. Thanks uh, to you and the university, to the Board of Trustees, the faculty, and the graduates for the invitation to be here. Uh, I'm honored uh, to address the class of 2010. To the graduates, uh, congratulations upon this day. Your hard work and perseverance have brought you to this milestone, and you are to be commended. Your families and friends are here and they are very proud. Make this day last as long as possible. Take lots of pictures, give lots of smiles and hugs. Savor it, it is truly unique. Uh, I have been here before. Two years ago, I was sitting out there as a proud parent watching my daughter graduate from UNC. Uh, that day was not quite as pretty as today. The uh, weather looked bad, the forecast was dreadful, the skies were dark and threatening. It looked bad. At the last moment, the decision was made to keep the festivities here and not move them indoors. And just as the graduates were about to march in, a tropical depression settled on Chapel Hill <laughs> and the bottom fell out. The rain began, driving, howling, cold wind, with no end in sight. James Meeser was the chancellor then. Most of the crowd scattered. We were soaked. It was awful. It was wonderful. <laughs> James Meeser, who was also soaking wet, finally decided to just dispense with all formalities. 
with one wave of the hand, sort of like Moses, he converted 5,000 degrees. <laughs> and we got out of here. It was a very short commencement. Uh, there were no speeches. Maybe it wasn't all bad. I don't know. <laughs> with, uh, with that day in mind, I am very grateful to see sunshine in a sky that is Carolina blue. I've been watching... I've been watching the weather for two months. Uh, I'm just as proud today because my wife, Renee, is a member of the class of 2010. Um, she is finishing her work for a degree in English, uh, work that I interrupted almost 30 years ago when I convinced her to get married. I'm not sure she wanted to back then, but we did anyway. It's a big day for our family. Uh, some of you are sad to be leaving, probably in shock that uh, your time here has gone by so quickly. Others are no doubt thrilled to be getting out of here. I guess. <laughs> Regardless of how you feel now, your emotional attachment to this place will only deepen as the years go by and you will find yourself drawn back time and time again. I have never met a Tar Heel who did not let it be known, usually within the first 30 seconds of a conversation, <laughs> that he was in fact a Tar Heel or that she loved her days in Chapel Hill. Let's face it, it's a great school. We all know it. There's so much to be proud of. You are leaving, but you're not going to be forgotten whether you are graduating with honors or without. <laughs> Regardless of what you studied or didn't study, you will not be forgotten. There are people on this campus who work in what's called development. That's, that's another word for fundraising, and they're watching you even as we speak. Um, they will follow you. Uh, they're very friendly. They'll send you letters, birthday cards, Christmas cards. And at first you may be flattered, but you'll soon learn these cards are very expensive. They will expect cards in return. Pledge cards, commitment cards. They even take credit cards. They will follow you well into your old age. And when you die, they will expect a sizable chunk of your estate. You will not be forgotten. But don't, don't be irritated. These are good folks, and they really, really want you to succeed. The generosity of others has played a major role in building this great institution. Those who have walked here before you have enriched your learning experience. It's important for you to give as a way of saying thanks, but also to invest in future generations. Give because others have given for you. Now, I have never written a long book, and I've never given a long speech. This one will last for 17 minutes from top to bottom. So hang on, I'm almost finished. Before I close, though, I am uh, expected to at least try to say something significant, something you might remember for more than 24 hours. Certain things are expected in commencement speeches, and I, I don't want you leaving here feeling as though you didn't get your money's worth. Not that I'm getting paid, but that's no big deal. <laughs> On campuses this spring across the country, commencement speakers are saying such things as, the future is yours. Take control of your destiny. Set your goals high, so on and so forth. These platitudes don't mean a whole lot, and I don't use them. You don't really don't want to hear them. Of course the future is yours. Who else would want it? <laughs> Take it. You can have it. We've had our chance and made a royal mess of things. 
I'm sure you can do better. I expect you will. Advice is common during these speeches. Someone who, who has been out there comes back here and shares a few nuggets of wisdom, a few tips on how to survive and succeed. Advice is very easy to give and e even easier not to follow. So I don't fool with it. You don't want to hear it. You don't need the advice. You've got the brains, the talent, and now the education. You're going to live your life the way you want to. You'll figure it out. On a couple of occasions, I have given a speech that I call the top 10 reasons you should stay in college until you are 30 years old. <laughs> it, uh, you know, you got a few laughs and had a little wisdom to it, but I realized it really wasn't being heard. You wouldn't hear it now. Let's face it. You're done. You're finished. You're ready to get out of here. It's time to move on. I stopped giving that speech because the hate mail from the parents was so vicious. <laughs> Actually, I do have one piece of advice. I guess sometimes we just can't help ourselves. Call home at least once a week. See? It's a proven fact that we call home less frequently the older we get. And that's wrong. It should be the other way around. As we get older, our parents get older. Email, Facebook, text, that's all good. Call home once a week so your parents can hear your voice and you can hear theirs. OK, oh, one, oh, one more piece of advice. Oh. Read at least one book a month. Now, OK. That may not sound like much, but the big publishing companies in New York have spent a lot of money studying you and your reading habits. You have terrified them. <laughs> they cannot figure you out. They don't know how many of you in five years will be reading books on Kindles, iPads, Nooks, Koboos, Sony e-readers. About half of the research suggests that you will read more because of these incredible devices. About half the research says you will read even less. They can't figure it out. As far as I'm concerned, I don't care if it's a hardback, paperback, ebook, or library book. Read. Read. Reading stimulates the brain and the imagination. A video takes away your imagination. Now, this is self-serving, obviously. <laughs> it's a proven fact that uh, people who read buy more books than people who don't read. So <laughs> I'm always thinking about book sales. Can't help it. Truthfully, I wish you'd read 10 books a month, or at least buy that many. <laughs> the, most, the most difficult part of writing a book is not devising a plot which will captivate the reader. It is not developing characters the reader will have strong feelings for or against. It is not finding a setting which will take the reader to a place he or she has never been. It is not the research, whether in fiction or in nonfiction. The most difficult task facing a writer is to find a voice in which to tell the story. A voice is pronunciation, diction, syntax, uh, dialogue, plot, care, the ABCs of writing. But a writer's voice is much more. A writer's voice is the tone, the mood, the point of view, the consciousness, the sense of credibility. I have never thought of writing as hard work. But I have worked hard to find a voice. All writers do. Sometimes we are successful, often we are not. But long before the last chapter is finished, and often before the first chapter is started, we search and search to find a voice. 
students of creative writing are constantly urged, find a voice, find a voice in which to tell the story. And to do this, they are taught to try different techniques, different narrations, different points of view, all in an effort to find the voice. When a writer finds a voice, the words flow freely, the sentences become paragraphs and pages and chapters, and the story is told. The writer is heard, and the reader is rewarded. In this respect, writing is a lot like life itself. In life, a voice is much more than the sound we make when we talk. Infants and preschoolers have voices and can make a lot of noise. But a voice is more than sound. The voice of change, the voice of compassion, the voice of the future, the voice of his generation, the voice of her people. We hear this all the time. Voices, not words. There are over 5,600 of you in the class of 2010, and I doubt seriously right now if any one of you believes that you will leave here today, go out into the world, start your career, and not be heard. Isn't that one of our greatest fears? We will not be heard. No one will listen to us. When we are ready to lead, there's no one to follow. But to be heard, you must find a voice. For your ideas to be accepted, for your arguments to be believed, for your work to be admired, you must find a voice. A voice has three essential elements. The first is clarity. When I was in high school, I discovered the novels of John Steinbeck. He was and is my favorite writer. The Grapes of Wrath is a book I've read more than all others. I admire his talent for telling a story, his compassion for the underdog, but what I really admire is his ability to write so clearly. His sentences are often rich in detail and complex, but they flow with a clarity that I still envy. His characters are flawed and tragic, often complicated, but you understand them because they have been so clearly presented. In life, we tend to ignore those who talk in circles, saying much, but saying nothing. We listen to and follow those whose words and ideas and thoughts and intentions are clear. The second element is authenticity. A few things I like better in life than getting lost in a good book written by an author who is in full command of his subject matter, either because he has lived the story or so thoroughly researched it. I read a lot of uh, books written by other lawyers, legal thrillers as they are called. I read them because I enjoy them. I also have to keep an eye on the competition. I can usually tell by page three if the author has actually been in a fight in a courtroom or whether you simply watch too much television. In life, we tend to discredit those who claim to be what they are not. We respect those who know their subject matter. We long for and respect credibility. The third element is veracity. In the past few years, the publishing industry has been scandalized by a handful of writers who wrote very compelling stories of their real-life adventures. These were good stories, they were well-written, the voices were clear and seemingly authentic. They sold for big money, they were marketed aggressively, they were reviewed favorably, and then they were exposed for being what they really were, frauds, fabrications, lies. The real-life adventures never happened. The books were pulled from the shelves, the publishers were embarrassed, Lawsuits were filed to retrieve the advances, and the writers' voices have been forever silenced. In life, finding a voice is speaking and living 
the truth. Each of you is an original. Each of you has a distinctive voice. When you find it, your story will be told. You will be heard. The size of your audience doesn't matter. What's important is that your audience is listening. You are lucky to have studied here, lucky and deserving. Many, many applied, and only you were chosen. You have been superbly educated, but now your time is up. You have to go. You can't stay here until you're 30. And besides, on August 21st, the freshmen will be here to replace you. One final thought. Right now, you want to be something. You have big dreams, big plans, big ideas, big ambitions. You want to be something. Don't ever forget what you want to be right now. The future has arrived. It commences now. Good luck.